In this episode of Clinical Examination in Practice, we will be reviewing the cardiovascular examination. When undertaking the clinical examinations covered in this series, it is important to follow a standard five-step initial approach when beginning the examination. Ensure that you have a private environment in which to examine your patient. Wash your hands prior to approaching the patient. Introduce yourself to the patient, explain what the examination will entail and gain consent. Ask the patient whether they are experiencing any pain. Ensure that the patient is correctly positioned and correctly exposed for the examination. Ensure that the patient is positioned comfortably at 45 degrees. On inspection, it is important to observe whether your patient appears to be unwell or in any distress. Do they appear breathless, cyanosed, or are they sweating? Their body habitus can also be estimated. Do they have any surgical scars, particularly on the chest, such as a central stenotomy or evidence of pacemaker insertion? On inspection of their surroundings, pay particular attention to oxygen use. If present, note the dose and delivery method. Other relevant observations include medications such as GTN sprays or tablets, evidence of whether the patient is eating and drinking, intravenous infusions and mobility aids. After inspecting your patient, approach them again and examine them from their right hand side where you will now start with their hands. You should observe for a resting tremor and after gauging the colour and temperature, you should look specifically for clubbing, peripheral cyanosis, splinter haemorrhages, Janeway lesions, Osler's nodes, coilonychia, skin or tendons anthemata and nicotine staining. Capillary refill time can also be assessed by applying gentle pressure to the distal phalanx for 5 seconds. Normal capillary refill time is within 2 seconds. Moving proximally from the hands, Identify and measure the rate and rhythm of the radial pulse using the index and middle finger of your right hand. The radial pulse is located laterally to flexor carpi radialis. The rate is calculated by measuring the pulse for 15 seconds and multiplying by 4 to give you the rate over 1 minute. Now assess the rhythm. Comment on whether it is regular, regularly irregular, or irregularly irregular. Now assess for radio-radial delay, followed by radio-femoral delay. The femoral pulse is located at the mid-inguinal point. After confirming that the patient does not have any pain in their shoulder, a collapsing pulse should be assessed. Moving proximally again, using your index and middle finger, palpate the brachial artery located in the anticubital fossa medial to the tendon of the biceps brachii. Assess the character and volume. The patient's blood pressure should be recorded. This is often forgotten by students. After measuring the blood pressure, continue to move proximally and examine the patient's neck. Palpate the carotid artery with your right index and middle finger, again assessing character and volume. The carotid pulse is located between the thyroid cartilage and the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid. After assessing the carotid pulse, the jugular venous pressure needs to be assessed. Ensure that the patient is positioned comfortably at a 45 degree angle and has relaxed their head and neck on a pillow. 
ask the patient to turn their head away from you. Identify the internal jugular venous pulsation, which when normal should be just above the level of the clavicle. The venous pressure is measured in centimetres and is given as an estimate of the height of the venous pulsation above the sternal angle. In healthy individuals, it should be no more than 3 centimetres. Remember that this assessment should be made with the patient positioned at 45 degrees. With the patient's permission, perform an abdominojugular reflux by gently applying pressure to the right upper quadrant of the abdomen may make the pulsation more visible. After examining the patient's neck, move superiorly to examine their face, checking for conjunctival pallor, evidence of corneal arclus, and xanthalasma. Look for a malar flush over the cheeks. Central cyanosis may be seen as a blue discoloration of the lips and tongue. You can also gauge an idea of the patient's dental hygiene. Moving inferiorly, you arrive at the precordium. Perform a close inspection noting any abnormalities. Do not forget to observe the lateral chest wall. After inspection, locate and palpate the apex beat, which is normally located in the fifth intercostal space in the mid-clavicular line. This can be located by firstly identifying the sternal angle. The second rib lies at this level, and this can be palpated. Immediately inferior to the second rib lies the second intercostal space, and from here you can count down to the fifth. If you are having difficulty palpating the apex beat, ask your patient to roll over onto their left hand side as this movement makes the pulse more prominent to palpate. If you suspect that the heart is enlarged, it can be helpful to start feeling for the apex beat from the axilla. Next palpate for any heaves or thrills. Now auscultate the heart sounds whilst simultaneously palpating the carotid pulse. There is a difference between the anatomical locations of each of the valves and the areas where they are clinically auscultated with a stethoscope. The anatomical locations of the valves are demonstrated here in blue. Now compare this to the clinical landmarks that are used in order to listen to them. They are demonstrated here in green. When listening to the heart, appreciate the first and second heart sound and listen for any additional sounds as you auscultate over these four regions. Using the diaphragm of your stethoscope, auscultate over the apex beat. This is the mitral region. Switch to the bell of your stethoscope and ask the patient to roll onto their left side. In addition to listening to the normal heart sounds, these manoeuvres help to identify whether the low-frequency mid-diastolic murmur of mitral stenosis is present. Maintain this position, switch back to the diaphragm and auscultate in the axilla. This is a common site of radiation for mitral murmurs. Return your patient to their normal position. Auscultate with the diaphragm over the fourth intercostal space at the left sternal edge. This is the tricuspid region. Now auscultate over the second intercostal space at the left sternal edge. This is the pulmonary region. Finally, auscultate over the second intercostal space at the right sternal edge. This is the aortic region. Whilst in this region, ask your patient to then sit forward and hold their breath after expiration. Auscultate again to identify whether the diastolic murmur of aortic regurgitation is present.
aortic regurgitation may also be heard at the left sternal edge and even at the apex if it is present. If you hear a suspected murmur, assess if it occurs between the first and second heart sound, which would represent a systolic murmur. Or does it occur after the second heart sound, but before the first, thus representing a diastolic murmur? Then assess whether there is any radiation. A murmur occurring in the aortic region may radiate to the carotids, and as previously mentioned, one occurring in the mitral region may radiate into the axilla. After auscultating the heart sounds, listen over the region of both the left and right carotid arteries. Listen for carotid bruies, or if a murmur was present in the aortic region, assess whether you can hear this radiating to the carotid region. Asking the patient to hold their breath for several seconds makes them easier to identify. Now ask the patient to sit forward in order to auscultate over the posterior lung bases to assess whether pulmonary edema is present. Whilst the patient is in this position, palpate for the presence of sacral edema at the bottom of the spine. Finally, inspect the patient's legs, commenting particularly on any swellings, scars or any signs of peripheral vascular disease. Assess for the presence of peripheral edema at the ankles and lower legs by applying gentle pressure for five seconds over a bony prominence. If edema is present, repeat this process and assess how far it extends proximally. It is important to note whether this edema is a unilateral or bilateral finding. This concludes the cardiovascular examination. In order to complete your examination, the peripheral pulses should be located and examined. If there were clinical concerns regarding cardiac failure, the abdomen should be examined for signs of ascites and hepatomegaly. Again, where clinically indicated, fundoscopy should be performed. After completing your examination, you will often be required to present your examination findings in the form of a summary. When presenting your findings, it is important to summarise the key points succinctly into two or three sentences. A common framework includes starting with the patient's name, age and occupation. This is then followed by a brief history of presenting complaint, followed by the positive examination findings and the important negative ones. If appropriate, End the summary with the most likely clinical diagnosis or differential diagnosis and any investigations and management that has already been put in place. Once you have prepared for the examination, inspected the patient and their surroundings, examine the patient's hands. Examine the radial pulse. Examine the brachial pulse and record the blood pressure. Examine the neck. Examine the face. Examine the precordium. Examine for carotid bruies. Examine the patient's back, including lung bases and sacral edema. Examine the legs. Complete your examination and record and present your findings. We hope that you have enjoyed this episode of Clinical Examination in Practice and now feel more confident in performing the cardiovascular system examination in the clinical setting. Why not make use of the additional interactive questions in order to consolidate and develop your learning? <laughs>